Elon Musk has been making waves in multiple industries, from launching cargo and people into space on reusable rockets, to electric cars and even underground tunnels for high-speed alternatives to bypass those pesky traffic jams. And while many are convinced that electric cars are the future, others such as the oil giants aren't so sure about that. In today's episode, we will look at how the sun is actually a formidable source of energy. If only there was a way to capture all of it, or even a small fraction of it, here on Earth. And we'll do a flashback into things that Elon Musk said during interviews and events. For instance, did you know back in 2014, Elon Musk was in Norway as a guest at an event full of oil giants. Was he able to convince them to switch away from oil? Well, let's find out, but first, let's get plugged in. Hi and welcome to EV Source. My name is Harry and I'm your host for today's dose of EVs and technology. Or maybe I should say a dose of Elon Musk since this episode is mostly about him, so I guess that kind of would make sense, right? Anyway, Elon Musk, you can never get enough of him. But before we dive in, check out this offer by Webull to get two free stocks. You'll get one stock valued up to $250 when you open a new account and another free stock valued up to $1,600 when you invest at least $100. This is a limited time offer, so get them while you can. The link is in the description below. Elon Musk has been hard at work to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy, which also happens to be the mission goal of Tesla. He's been saying for years that we should move away from fossil fuels as soon as possible because they're going to run out eventually. Tesla is setting an example for how they imagine the world transitioning to sustainable and renewable energy. As you probably know by now, Tesla is much more than just a car company. They also make their own batteries that are not only used in electric vehicles, but in energy storage systems such as the Powerwall for homes and offices and the Megapack for commercial use. It's safe to say that Tesla is also in the energy business since they create solar products such as solar roofs and solar panels that store energy in power walls or in mega packs in the case of large-scale grid energy storage. And let's not forget that Tesla is also working on a fully autonomous self-driving software that will one day liberate your time from sitting behind the wheel to something more productive, or maybe just getting extra few minutes of sleep on your way to work. But some people still remain skeptical of Elon Musk and Tesla, and as you can probably already guess, many of those people work in the oil industry. So let's take a look at what Elon said about how he imagines Tesla making more electric cars and why renewable energy is the future. In order to make a lot of electric cars, you need a lot of batteries. And um, the, the, the lithium-ion lithium -ion battery capacity of the world in terms of production capacity is really not uh, big enough yet, uh, nor does it make the most advanced type of uh, batteries that, that we really need for long-range electric cars. In order to solve the battery problem, Tesla is now not only making its own batteries, but also getting into the mining business for the raw materials as well as recycling the old batteries since most of the materials in old batteries are still good for new products. Of course, Tesla will continue to purchase batteries from its partners such as Panasonic and LG Chem in order to maximize the battery output. But currently, Tesla is quickly approaching 100 gigawatt hour output when you combine what Tesla gets from its suppliers and what it makes in its own factories. It's estimated that Tesla would reach 100 gigawatt hour battery output by 2022. Um, about a third of the output of the, the gigafactory is intended as stationary storage, uh, primarily to be paired with renewables, but also to do grid buffering in non-renewable situations. I think we'll see really a very huge demand for stationary storage. The world could be powered many times over by solar if you had enough uh, battery capacity to pair it with it. The, the amount of energy that, that reaches the Earth from the sun is staggeringly high. We have this enormous fusion generator in the sky uh, that, that is lobbing out vast amounts of energy. And I'm, I'm talking about just using land area. To give you an idea of how much energy we're talking about, in one year, Earth absorbs approximately 3,850 billion terajoules of energy, which is approximately 1.07 billion terawatt hours. 
That's more than 7,000 times the energy we use globally. Now get this, in less than 80 minutes, the sun provides us with the same amount of energy that the entire world uses in one year. Of course, this does not mean that we could actually recover that amount of energy, but it illustrates that solar power offers enormous potential. But even if we were able to capture just 1% of its energy hitting the Earth, that would be enough to power all of our global energy needs for at least 70 years. To capture enough energy for one year of our current global energy needs, we would need to capture only 0.000143% of the sun's energy. If you take a nuclear plant and you took its current output and compared that to just taking solar panels and putting solar panels on the, la on the area used by the nuclear power plant, because these typically have a big keep out zone, you know, about maybe five kilometers or there thereabouts, where, where building houses, you know, and, and dense, uh, you know, any kind of dense office or, or housing space, usually people don't want to do that near a nu nuclear power plant. <laughs> and when you factor the keep out zone into, into account, um, the solar panels put on that area will typically generate more power than the nuclear power plant. An awkward moment of silence from the audience there, but that was an excellent example from Elon Musk. Let me take that one step further. For instance, the United States alone consumed approximately 3,800 terawatt hours of energy in 2020. To convert the entire country to solar, you would only need a fairly small corner of Nevada or Texas. It's that little red speck on the map. That's only about 0.6% of the total land maps of the United States. <laughs> that's it. That's all that's required to power the entire the country with solar power alone. But what about when hackers decide to target pipelines and power stations? I'm sure you heard of the Colonial Pipeline that got hacked recently and they paid over $5 million ransom after over 5,500 miles of pipeline got shut down. This is a major reason why you're seeing rising gas prices recently. Not the only one, but a big part of it. Now the FBI reported that the group responsible for the hack goes by the name Darkside and they're based out of East Europe. These types of hacks are becoming more common by the day and the question that should be in everybody's mind is if they can hack big essential companies like this, what's stopping them from hacking your phone or your computer? If you have any sensitive information on your devices or you do banking and investing online, it's critical that you use a private virtual network or VPN to keep your information safe. And this is why I highly recommend Surfshark VPN, which is well received by our viewers. You can connect as many devices as you want with just one account and it's very easy to set up. Use my code to get 83% off and three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. The link is in the description below and thanks to Surfshark and all of you for supporting the channel. What kind of a threat do you think you are to the oil and gas industry? Well, I don't think we're much of a threat. I mean, yet, you know, yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, I, I mean, the, 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 the more obvious threat is that we're going to run out of uh, hydrocarbons to mine and burn. That, that's rather obvious. I mean, uh, it's but not a... It's no a, time soon, judging from the comments we've had this morning. Well, it depends on what soon means. Um, I mean, there's, it, it's, get, it's clearly getting harder and harder. Um, my understanding is that the cost of extraction is, is doubled tri and in some cases tripled. Um, so it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to find uh, hydrocarbons and it's getting much more expensive to extract them. Um, and r really, we're just arguing about the when uh, hydrocarbons run out or become prohibitively expensive, not if. I mean, I don't think there's, there's anyone he here who would say there's a, it's an if, not a when. Uh, they will run out for sure. This is why I call it the dumbest experiment in history ever. Uh, why would you do this? <laughs> so why run this crazy experiment where we take trillions of tons of carbon from underground and put it in the atmosphere and oceans. This is an insane experiment. It's the dumbest experiment in, in human history. This is something Elon has been saying for years now, but he's not the only one to mention this. We've known for years that fossil fuels will run out eventually. Let me show you a fun little website that I discovered the other day that shows a countdown to how many years we have left before we run out of fossil fuels. 46 years. That means we will run out of fossil fuels before the end of this century. The website also has many other metrics in case you're interested. I'll leave a link to the website in the description as well. You don't think the human standpoint. ingenuity 
and technology and resourcefulness will mean that we will still have abundant fossil fuels no, available. Not. I mean, this has been going on for some <laughs> time. They think you've reached the boundaries and yet they find more. And you know, look at the whole shale gas revolution. You know, that just, was stuff it, that people said would never be able to be extracted. Th there, are, there are time extensions on the game, but the game is going to come to an end. That should be absolutely certain. Obviously, frankly. So if you're in, in, in non-renewables, it, it's like being, you're, you're stuck in a room where the oxygen is gradually depleting. And then outside, it's not. <laughs> so you want to get out that room. Um, and I think the, the, the ones that get out of the room sooner will be better off. Did anyone listen? Not really. Remember he said this back in 2014. For years, none of the legacy automakers were taking Tesla or Elon Musk seriously. Only in a recent couple of years, we've seen a move toward electrifying vehicles by other companies. And I'm going to say that they are a little late to the party, but they might have a chance to stay afloat long enough to keep their businesses going. Although chances are some of the giants might shrink in size along the way, while others might not even exist if they don't get serious about electric vehicles soon. But remember, this is just my personal opinion. Um, I simply look at, at the future and say, what is the thing that will actually work? Um, it, and using a non-renewable resource, um, obviously, will not work. So we must find an alternative. But if, if, I, if, if there was a button I could press to stop all hydrocarbon usage today, I would not press it. You would not press of it? Of course not. OK. Did you expect him to say that? <laughs> You would not press it because... It would, it it would because cause human civilization to come to a halt. Every hospital would have to close down. That would be ridiculous. Island. So it would be irresponsible to press that button. Um, but w w what does need to happen is to, if we can, accelerate the transition towards renewables. That's the sensible thing to do. Saudi Arabia has an enormous amount of sunlight, and that, that, that will be there for billions of years. Or well, at least one billion years until the sun eventually engulfs us, but a billion years, solid. I love that answer from Elon. He's making it clear that he's not against fossil fuels, but in the same sentence, he also makes it clear that the most logical thing to do right now is to accelerate the world's transition to renewable energy. Many parts of the world get an enormous amount of sunlight. Putting giant solar farms in key locations around the globe makes sense to make the most use of the amount of sunlight we're able to capture. You know, in investing in the, the, the solar resource is the thing that, that's really going to preserve the, the long-term future. Not, not so much the oil and gas. I mean, that's, that's a temporary thing. In, in the future, we'll look back, and by future, I'm not talking about super far in the future, I'm talking about towards the end of the century. We will look back on gasoline-powered cars the same way we look back on coal, as sort of a quaint anachronism that's in a museum. You might not think this way now because gasoline-powered vehicles are still widely in use throughout the world, but fast forward a couple of decades and your perspective might change very quickly. The thing that I want to ask you about is patents, patents as you call them. Yeah. Um, now, a few months ago, you decided to open them up, make them open source right. for a, 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 some key areas of Tesla car development. What is no, the thinking all, all, behind all of our patents. Oh, all of them. Okay. Yes. What is the thinking behind them? And is that something that perhaps the oil and gas industry should consider? Um, yeah, I think patents are... I don't like patents, personally. Um, you know, when I was uh, first starting out developing technology, I got lots of patents and I thought this was a good thing. And then I sort of discovered that a patent was really like buying a lottery ticket to a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I'd rather not buy as many those tickets. Um, and um, you look at sort of the battle between Apple and Samsung and who's really winning there? You know, the lawyers are winning, certainly, but, not, but neither of those two companies. Um, and in, in the case of, um, of Tesla, I, it, I thought, well, would Tesla ever sue some other car company if they were using our patents to try to make them stop? making electric cars, we would never do such a thing. So why, why pretend that we would? Slowing down the competition would go against Tesla's mission statement, so doing the opposite is what would help with Tesla's mission, which is why they've made all their patents open source. But it doesn't seem to be helping much since many of the manufacturers of electric vehicles are still lagging behind. The companies that are somewhat taking electric cars seriously might have about five years or so of catching up to do. But that's only if Tesla stops innovating, which they're not. They're actually going full steam ahead and aiming to have 3 terawatt hours of battery production by 2030, while companies like Volkswagen are aiming for 240 gigawatt hours within the same time frame. This alone should give you an idea of where we're headed. How does one go about really reducing the costs of a venture? Well, you have to innovate. You have to do different things. And there has to be a, a tight feedback loop on innovation. 
And one of the things I think is advantageous for the way the SpaceX operates is that the engineering team and the production team are in the same facility and there is good communication back and forth. So as the engineers see that they've designed something that is difficult to manufacture, they can adjust their design quickly to make it easier to build. Um, and and at, at the pace at which we're able to do new versions of the rocket is also much faster. So uh, innovation, just improving things, is, is key. Though Elon was referring to SpaceX, the same principles apply to Tesla. Tesla does many iterations of its design and engineering challenges in a very short time due to the way they've structured their company. Large corporations like General Motors, for instance, also have engineers coming up with new ideas that could make cars more efficient and cheaper. Those ideas then get submitted to their review process, which goes from one hand to another, before finally reaching the top, if it even makes it there. It only takes one person in the middle who has very little understanding of engineering to look at it and go, hmm, this seems a little bit uh, expensive, uh, so uh, maybe you know, just send it back and have them change some things. Not only does this process take a lot of valuable time, but it can also kill great ideas before they ever get to fruition. There needs to be an expectation of innovation. The, the compensation structure must reflect that. There must also be an allowance for failure um, because uh, if you are trying something new, uh, necessarily that there's some chance it will not work. So if, if you punish people too much for failure, then they will respond accordingly and the innovation you will get will be very incrementalist. Nobody's gonna try anything bold for fear of getting fired or being you know, uh, punished in some way. So the, there must be, a um, the, the risk reward must be balanced um, and, and, and favor taking uh, bold moves. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will not happen. I hope the people at the venue who were mostly from the big oil companies were taking notes because these are very valuable things to take back to your company and implement some changes that would help their business. But I have my doubts. If this episode raised any thoughts, then make sure to type them out in the comments below to start conversations around this topic. And don't forget to get your true free stocks and make sure you're surfing on the internet safely by using the Surfshark VPN. Thank you for watching EV Source. Keep charging ahead and I'll see you in the next one. Stay safe and take care.